are number one, that red meat and animal foods are incorrectly vilified. They've been you know, just criminalized unjustly for 70 years based on shoddy science, and they're incredibly valuable in the human diet and should not be excluded if you want optimal health. And number two, that plant foods have had to develop toxins to survive in their coevolution with animals, and they, have, and they have these toxins and they can cause problems for some people. Okay, we are recording. This is another episode of the Automate and Grow podcast. My guest today is Dr. Paul Saladino, who is affectionately known as the carnivore doctor or the carnivore MD. Paul has written a book called The Carnivore Code, and he is spreading the good news of eating as much meat as humanly possible, right? Pretty much, pretty much. And it's a, it's a message that needs to be heard today with our current uh, plant-based zeitgeist, which I fear is hurting people, but we'll get into it. I love it. Okay, so how did this all start for you? Were you always like strictly a carnivore focused doctor or dietitian or you're not a dietitian, right? No, so I am a doctor. I'm an MD. I'm a traditionally trained medical doctor. I did residency at the University of Washington in Seattle, did medical school at the University of Arizona. Before I went to medical school, I actually practiced for four years as a physician assistant in cardiology. So I've been in medicine now for, you know, 15, 16 years and um, I am uh, I'm board certified as a physician nutrition specialist. So there's really no nutrition residency for, you know, MDs, but the board certification that you can get for nutrition is something that I have. And I, I think about nutrition as the center of my practice because I think that food is what drives health and disease. And I take a very contrarian, challenging status quo stance, which we'll get into here. I haven't always been so focused on red meat and eating meat and really seeing things from this perspective. But it's been a lot of years, more than a decade now, that I've been thinking about the way that food acts as the biggest lever for humans in health and disease. And everybody, you know, I think we all sort of dance around this issue. Western medicine does a fantastic job of treating illness acutely, uh, putting in stents, doing emergency surgeries, casting bones, suturing wounds. Western medicine does a really abysmal job of treating chronic disease, hypertension, heart attacks, coronary artery disease, diabetes. We're horrible at this. It takes the majority of our healthcare dollars. And so within Western medicine, we ostensibly are trying to treat the root cause of disease, but mostly what we do is treat the symptoms with pharmaceuticals. And from the beginning of my medical career, you know, many years ago when I was starting out as a physician assistant, I've been interested in in what food was best for humans and how the food we're eating actually modifies this healthy or diseased state and trying to understand what is, you know, what is really driving chronic disease. And the deeper I've gone into that, the more I've sort of looked at the mainstream zeitgeist and said, that is really wrong. I think that um, in our zeal over plant-based ideologies and in our zeal looking at the research, we've thrown the baby out with the bathwater and we can get into all of that. I think that um, we have misinterpreted many of these studies and are saying that meat and animal foods are the culprit when in fact it's something else. And we can get into what that is as well in this podcast. So I, I think from a personal point of view, um, you know, I'm, I'm pretty aware of what I eat just because I've traditionally had, for example, um, uh, like migraines. And I think that was probably one of the first things that tipped me off. Plus, I had a really weird incident that I can always tell you about. But um, there was one my appendix ruptured, but it was a very slow process to rupture, <laughs> which should have killed me. <laughs> and I think for me, what got me interested in this was I really broke down my foods for those two reasons. And my observation is personally, like I definitely am better with a certain type of diet than another. And it doesn't involve a lot of the traditional ideas of avoiding fat, um, you know, a carbohydrate rich diet, even a lot of vegetables. I find those are actually really hard on my body. So I'm curious, like, did, did you have a similar uh, epiphany and was it based upon what you're observing or a personal experience? So it was, like I said, it was kind of framed in this career, this personal passion to understand how to help patients. But at the same time, I was having a personal experience with my own autoimmune disease. Okay. So I have eczema and asthma, which listeners might not think of as autoimmune disease, but they are. They're autoimmune illness. 
they exist on a spectrum of A to P. Atopic dermatitis is eczema. And they are, you know, an autoimmune condition that at times was pretty debilitating for me. When I was in residency, I had eczema so severe that it was all over my lower back and really oh, limit, wow. limited what I could do. And in medical school, I was doing a lot of jujitsu and get infected on the mat. It was a big problem and it was autoimmune. And so you go to the dermatologist and they'll give you creams or tell you that you're, you're not moisturizing enough. And these are not the answer. You know, no one has eczema because they're not moisturizing their skin enough. It's related to diet. It's related to diet, but no one is really doing the work to understand the foods that are triggering the immune system. So I was on that path in the broader framework of understanding what was causing my patient's autoimmune illness and my own autoimmune illness. And looking at the foods that were triggering my eczema, it similarly became pretty clear to me that many of the foods that we had traditionally been told were healthy, leafy greens, plants, things like this, were actually causing my eczema to get worse. Um, now, some animal foods also seem to trigger my eczema, including milk and egg whites, um, specifically milk more than anything. But right. I think that, you know, this is not to say that animal foods never cause uh, immunologic reactions in people, but the animal foods that do are animal foods that are kind of evolutionarily inconsistent with what we should be eating. And the biggest ones are, is really milk. And, and I think that a lot of times when people go vegan, or vegetarian, they cut out milk, right. and that is an improvement, <laughs> and they think it was the meat, or they also go low fat, and they cut out the vegetable oils. And you and I have talked about vegetable oils, yeah. and we'll probably get yeah. into vegetable oils in this talk as well. But I think that when vegan diets work, when vegetarian diets work, it's the exclusion of dairy and vegetable oils, and the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater, and these very healthy meats get vilified and thrown under the bus. And then eventually, sadly, people end up with long-term nutritional deficiencies and problems because they're not getting nutrient-rich animal foods. So my story was that I was, at that point, I was actually a raw vegan many years ago. So oh, 15 wow. years ago, okay. I was a raw <laughs> vegan for seven months and I lost 25 pounds of muscle, of muscle. Not the kind of weight that you wanna lose. I've never been obese but I got really skinny. I'm 170 pounds now and 5'10". So you can imagine that I was 145 pounds. That's pretty skinny for 5'10". Um, and, and now I've got 25 more pounds of muscle when I'm eating enough protein from muscle meat. So I, I realized vegan wasn't the answer for me. My eczema did not go away. I had horrible gas. I had bloating. Wow. It, it, was, it was no fun to be around from a gastrointestinal perspective. But I subsequently added meat back in my diet, felt better from a muscle mass perspective, from a performance perspective, and continued to have problems with eczema. So then I started looking at plant toxins and realized there's this whole myriad, there's this array of plant toxins, whether it's lectins or oxalates or this whole broad category of phytoalexins, plant defense chemicals, that can really trigger our immune system. And I started cutting out different types of plant foods, high histamine plant foods, et cetera, et cetera, and, and that was really the beginning of my carnivore journey, thinking, well, I'm just cutting out more and more plants. And I got to the point where I was essentially eating almost no plants and I still had eczema. And at that point, I kind of did the research and I thought, why am I eating any plants? Are there any nutrients in plants that I have to have? The surprising thing that I discovered nutritionally is there's not. If you eat really? animals okay. well, if you eat animal meat and organs and you eat animals nose to tail like our ancestors do, then you will get every single nutrient that humans need. The first thing people always think of is vitamin C, but there's plenty of vitamin C in animal foods. Uh, it's something that's quite surprising to people. The other thing people think is vitamin K, but they're not aware of vitamin K2, which is generally the animal-based form of vitamin K. There's tons of that in animal foods. So you really discover if you look into this nutritional literature that animal foods have all the nutrients that humans need. We don't need fiber. We don't need plant foods. And a lot of us feel much better without them. And that's when you arrive, and that's when I arrived two years ago at an entirely animal-based diet, a carnivore diet. And the last two years have been some of the best in my life from a health perspective. My eczema has completely gone away. It's never recurred. Uh, you know, my mood is better. My body composition remains really good. Um, my sleep is great. My recovery is good. And I don't, when I do lab tests, there are no negative effects. And I assure all the listeners that I poop every day. It's beautiful. You I do think not we're all need excited to hear about that. What's that? I think we're all excited to hear that. But yeah, yeah right. <laughs> but just even saying, 
even suggesting to someone that this is a possibility raises so many questions and I'm happy to go down all of those roads, yeah. but that's kind of my story that it was that's driven cool. by my eczema. And now there are tens of thousands of people starting to realize maybe I don't need all these plants. Now, I'm not saying that everyone needs to cut out all plant foods. The main, the main sort of theses in my book, The Carnivore Code, that's the first edition. Um, yeah, <laughs> I don't know if we're gonna do video, it's right there. Yeah, it's and the video. second edition is coming out August the 4th, 2020. But the main two theses in the book are number one, that red meat and animal foods are incorrectly vilified. They've been you know, just criminalized unjustly for 70 years based on shoddy science and they're incredibly valuable in the human diet and should not be excluded if you want optimal health. And number two, that plant foods have had to develop toxins to survive in their co-evolution with animals and they, have, and they have these toxins and they can cause problems for some people Understanding that plants exist on a spectrum of toxicity and eliminating the plants that are most challenging for us while making animal foods, especially red meat, the most vilified food out there, the center of our diet, we will thrive. So those are really the theses of my book. And it's so, very controversial. It's exciting though, because I think it, it's, it's definitely it's weird. I mean, and helping I, a lot of people. Yeah. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that you came on to talk about a few things because it's funny because like a lot of the things that you just, there's a few bullet points I made. The first one about plant toxins. And I, again, relate it to a personal, you know, discovery where I'm like, you know, I don't always feel great after I eat certain vegetables. Like, so, and I feel like things that should be good for me cause me a lot of um, not only stomach problems, but actually headaches. Yes. And, and I think you mentioned plant toxins and I, I kind of joke with people because I don't really, I don't, I'm not a carnivore for the record, but I'm definitely an omnivore with, you know, heavy fats and meat in my diet and fish. But the plant side of it is really interesting to me because I even joke that haven't you seen little shop of horrors? Like plants are not your friends. They're not your friend. They have defense mechanisms. And then we also have this whole category or majority of like these genetically modified organisms. And I don't know how much this plays into it where they're making really tough, fibrous plants to survive the environment and pestilence. And then we're ingesting it. And I, I kind of suspect, and I don't know, maybe you've done research into this, all those things add up to a lot of problems. They definitely do. I mean, if you think about plant and animal coevolution, it's been going on for 450 million years. And have you ever seen Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory? Both of them. Where they walk into that big room and everything's made out of candy. And you can eat everything, right? It's like lollipop trees and candy canes and you can eat the grass and it's a chocolate river. That's not the way plants are, you know? That is not the world we live in. It's completely, it's diametrically opposed to that. You walk out into the wilderness and every single plant out there is trying to kill you. Thank you. This is what I keep saying to people. Yeah. Every single plant out there is trying to dissuade you from eating it. And they're not chasing you with a hatchet. They're just sitting there going like, hey, this is my space. I'm doing my thing. Maybe if I'm a fruiting plant for part of the year, I'm going to make a fruit that's less toxic to you. And I want you to spread my seed. That's our arrangement. But the rest of the year, please don't eat my bark. Please don't eat my roots. Please don't eat my seeds. Please don't eat my leaves. And if you do, the only way that I'm going to survive and we're going to coexist is if I put toxins in there. And this is not conjecture. Yeah. This is not opinion. This is botanical science. I'm going to put toxins in there and, and they're going to make you fart or burp or have a stomach ache or get diarrhea or get bloated or get a skin rash or have a migraine headache. I mean, migraines, as you say, are very strongly related to food sensitivity. It's There's a difference between the food free. allergy yeah. that causes anaphylaxis and swelling in the throat and food sensitivity. The food, they're mediated by different antibodies in the body. Food anaphylaxis is IgE, but there are IgG mediated sort of food sensitivities that are probably behind much of the autoimmune disease that we see today. And these are different immunoglobulins, different sort of immune reactions. So just because somebody doesn't have anaphylaxis and die when they eat kale, doesn't mean that that kale isn't really wreaking havoc in their gut or causing other issues in their body. And the list goes on and on with all sorts of plant foods that are probably not ideal for humans. Now, this isn't to say that humans have never eaten these foods, but what I suggest in my book is that they're, they're really, they should be viewed as survival foods. They are fallback foods. Our ancestors ate 
mostly animal foods. And that's, again, something that's corroborated strongly by the anthropologic and ethnographic literature and studying currently living indigenous hunter-gatherers. And then, furthermore, they would eat plants when nothing else is available. If you're going to die of starvation, you might eat some plant foods, but you're also going to know which are less toxic and how to detoxify them. This is where the historical use of fermentation comes into play. But the fermentation process, so sauerkraut is the fermentation of brassica vegetables. It also detoxifies many of the most harmful chemicals in those plants making them a little bit less toxic while we are using them for survival food. So the, the picture you. starts to emerge. We've become completely, you know, we've become completely confused in 2020. We're elevating plant foods to the realm of, you know, demigods and saying red meat is bad for you, when in fact it's the complete opposite. Plant foods are survival foods, and red meat is the food that's always been treasured by our ancestors forever and provides all these unique nutrients and really made us who we are. So, and you mentioned fermented foods, because I think if you look at anyone that does research on this, fermented foods are generally seen as very beneficial to gut health, right? They are. And I think that, you know, personally, I think that that is overplayed. Is you it? Know? Okay. Yes, because if you, the, most of the fermentations are, are lactobacillus fermentations, lactobacillus odophilus. This is a pretty ubiquitous bacteria in the environment. And, and they're, they're thought to be beneficial to gut health because they have these organisms. Maybe for some people they are, but I don't think that they're a panacea or magical. Historically, they've been used as detoxification. So you can take toxic plants many times and ferment them, and they get to be more edible by humans because the toxins are broken down. The bacteria do the work for us. That's interesting. Um, and then you, you brought up, which you know I didn't want to skip over the aspect of milk, and again, relating it to my personal experience, I think I mentioned over a period of probably about seven months, I was going through a, a, what turned out to be a um, appendix tear that mm. turned into a rupture, and I was sicker and sicker and sicker. And the doctors were going through this thing of, you don't have enough fiber in your diet, you need Metamucil, you need to you know, have more veg vegetables in your diet, and it got worse and worse and worse. And to the point where you were relating to how you lost all that weight um, when you went on to a vegan diet, I dropped to like, I think I dropped about 127 pounds. Wow. It was, it, and I honestly thought, you know, I had a young kid at the time who's now 21, but <laughs> um, at the time I was like, man, I, there, nobody's giving me answers. I'm going to die. And I, so I had to, you know, hack it myself really. And milk to me was a big part of my diet then. And I cut it all out and everything changed. Now my appendix did rupture, but I suspect that there was an element of how much milk I was drinking and what happened to my appendix. I absolutely, you know, when I was in medical school, I remember being up at two in the morning for a surgery on my surgery rotation and the surgeon saying, what happened tonight to cause this appendix to burst in this patient? And the answer that you give as a medical student is a fecal lift, just some random stars align. You get a piece of poop that gets stuck in the entrance to the appendix. And that was always a very unsatisfying explanation for me. I never believed that. And I thought, that's crazy. I don't buy that one bit. It's not true. I think that there's got to be something more complex going on. And I think in a lot of people, it's an autoimmune or semi-immune phenomenon. We know the appendix is an immunologic organ. There are multiple lymph glands. There are multiple collections of immune cells in the appendix. It's a vestigial structure, but vestigial is relative. Vestigial is a sort of an evolutionary holdover that we think is no longer forming, uh, having a use in humans. But there are, there are definitely things in the appendix, pyres patches, there are immune glands, immune collections of cells that you could imagine a situation, you could hypothesize that if you are eating foods that are triggering your immune system, is your appendix more swollen? Is it more likely to become occluded? Is it more likely to become a blind loop? Nobody ever thinks about these things. They just take it out. They just cut it you out. Know? You don't need it. <laughs> you don't need it. And, and hopefully, I mean, you're, you're usually pretty good without it, but uh, it, it's really a wake up call. There's something going on. Why is it that the rest of us don't, you know, have an appendix that comes out? And I think that um, there's probably something there. It's an interesting idea, at least. I don't, I don't buy the mainstream narrative there either. Yeah. And I think for me, just even um, respiratory health wise, my respiratory health improved dramatically because I absolutely used to be like a person that would get pneumonia once a year. Now I lived in Canada so there's obviously an uh, environmental aspect. But mm -hmm. when I removed that from my diet after the appendix thing was dealt with, um, 
suddenly I wasn't getting pneumonia every year. <laughs> so I, I'm curious about other people's experience and if, you know, it's probably part of it. Like those are, those are obviously not related. Well, they're related to overall health, right? And yeah. And again, yeah. I think that the, the overarching narrative here is understand what foods are nourishing you and understand what foods are triggering your immune system. And we said in the beginning that there are some animal foods, most usually, most commonly, dairy and egg whites that can cause people to react immunologically. And if you cut those out, you know, dairy much more than egg whites, but if you cut those out, most people are usually fine. But um, I think that uh, a lot of people can tolerate dairy, but the main offenders are usually plant foods, but they can give different symptoms too. I, I, dairy triggers my eczema and it's, you know, I'm not saying that, that it's, that it's animal foods are good, plant foods are bad. It's a little more nuanced. I think Asian cultures are, have a lot of lactose intolerance. Um, yes. People with, um, you know, that are darker, that are from like a lot of African Americans and even Caribbeans have a really hard time with a heavy lactose um, element in their diet, right? Yes. And lactose is a two, two um, it's a disaccharide uh, and it's different than, than the immunologic. It, that has to do with persistence or loss of an enzyme called lactase oh, okay, got it. in the human gut. And, and really most of the immunologic reactivity with, lac, with, excuse me, with dairy has to do with casein and whey, which are two other milk proteins. So then that brings us full circle, which is, you know, I think a lot of these issues you can trace to the things we've just been talking about, plants, dairy, and then that brings you full circle to red meat, which is traditionally seen as the culprit be behind a lot of different diseases, including heart disease, right? Yeah, incorrectly though. And if you look at why it's seen that way, the science is abysmal. It's based on epidemiology. If you ask someone why they think red meat causes heart disease, they either won't know the studies or they'll, they'll have to admit the studies are epidemiology, which is observational evidence. There are zero studies that are interventional studies that show that red meat is harmful or inflammatory for humans. I'll repeat that. There are zero interventional studies that show that red meat is harmful to humans. But there are epidemiology studies, these are observational studies, that associate the consumption of red meat with higher rates of heart disease. What's the problem here? How do these studies work? They give someone a food frequency questionnaire. They give 100 or 1,000 or 5,000 people a food frequency questionnaire and it says, how many times in the last 10 years did you eat red meat per week? And then they'll say, okay, look, the people that ate more red meat had more heart disease. That's a correlation. It's not a causation. These studies are never meant to draw causative inferences. They're meant to generate hypotheses, which can then be tested with interventional studies. Now, the problem is that these correlations get made into supposed causations, or at least they get uh, conflated into these by the media when they say red meat is associated with heart disease. Well, technically, that's not an incorrect statement all of the time, except that it's a cherry-picked statement. There are some epidemiology studies that do not show an association between red meat and heart disease, and there are others that do. And the reason this is because of what we call unhealthy user bias or healthy user bias, most likely. So you can go to Asia, and there's a study of 183,000 men and women in Asia across multiple countries. And the men that ate the most red meat had the lowest rates of heart disease. Oh, really? The women, the women that ate the most red meat had the lowest rates of cancer. So do you mean to tell me that in Asia, meat is good for men? and good for women, but in the US it's bad for us? No, that makes no sense evolutionarily. We're not that different genetically. These observational studies are testing societal narratives because who eats red meat when red meat has been to sold to us as the devil's food for the last 70 years? Right. Rebels, people that smoke more, drink more, exercise less, ride more motorcycles, and are out in the sun less. Wait. But an observational you study can't tell you any of those other factors that could be associated. You think, so let's go back to this food frequency questionnaire. Say a group of people has eaten more red meat over the last 10 years. They're also more likely to be rebels. They're more likely to smoke and drink and less exercise, not see their doctor, not get a colonoscopy, not get a mammogram, not be in the sun. That, all of those things could be, could be actually what's happening here. 
There are some amazing graphs online at a website called Spurious Correlations. <laughs> okay. Um, there is, there is a, a, a very strong correlation between the number of movies that Nicolas Cage has appeared in year over year and the number of deaths by homicide. Right? <laughs> so Nicolas Cage is like a serial killer? Nicolas Cage is causing people to murder people. <laughs> or uh, less morbidly, the per capita margarine use in Maine is very highly correlated to the divorce rate. Meaning that as more people eat margarine, more people get divorced. And as less people eat margarine, less people get divorced. Is margarine causing divorce in Maine? No, that's absurd. Like this is the, this is the absurdity of correlation being made into causation when it can't be, right? You can correlate things and they have no actual real connection. Yeah, this got is it. The problem with epidemiology studies, right? Mm -hmm. That you can say to someone, um, you know, how much red meat? And the flip side is also true. So these two sides of the equation are unhealthy user bias, which is what I talked about earlier. The idea that because in the United States, in the West, we've been told since 1960 and Ansel Keys and the demonization of saturated fat that red meat is bad for you. We hear this. It's on every news media outlet. So who eats red meat? People that are sort of going to say, F you, you know, I'm going to do what I want right? So those are the people that eat more red meat. Those are the people that are going to have worse health outcomes. That makes more sense. They're the rebels. And similarly, who's going to eat more vegetables? The people that are healthy, the people that are doing healthy behaviors, playing more tennis, the flip side. These are the goody two shoes. And, you know, in the least pejorative way that I can say that these are people who are exercising, who are in the sun, who eat, you know, who eat less processed food, who um, go see their doctor more, and they're more likely to be of a higher socioeconomic status. So there's two sides of the equation that make that just inevitably make this a muddied um, correlation, and so, it's all based on societal narrative. In so Asia, for people that don't know, Ansel Keys was a famous physiologist, right? He's a famous physiologist. I believe he was a physician, and he worked um, in the 1960s and 1970s, uh, and he was fervently of the opinion that saturated fat led to heart disease. And um, he unfortunately promulgated very, uh, a very large amount of poorly done science, much of which was cherry picked and all of which was epidemiology. He was involved in a number of interventional trials which did not show that saturated fat caused heart disease oh. and then removed his name from the publication of those trials, including what? the Minnesota Coronary Heart Study, which was a very controlled 9,000 persons trial done over five years that clearly showed that when you increase the saturated fat in people's diet and decrease the polyunsaturated vegetable oil, they do better. They do better. They have less heart attacks, wow. but their LDL actually goes up. See, this was Ansel Keys' hypothesis. And that study was not published until 2015 or 1998. I think it was originally published in 98 okay. and then published in 2015 by Chris Ramsden. And they asked the authors, why didn't you publish this study? And they said, the results weren't what we wanted. Whoa, wait. Like, yeah, this is shadow banning of okay. research. It was done in 1968 to 1973, wasn't published for 25 years or 15 years later because it didn't support the prevailing hypothesis that saturated fat caused heart disease and it actually argued against it. This was an interventional trial, the Minnesota Coronary Heart Trial. Ansel Keys was involved in this and removed his name from the trial because it completely disproved his hypothesis. But he was really the driving factor behind our nation's misconception, all of this misleading propaganda around saturated fat and red meat came from his work. Now, I don't believe necessarily that he was an evil man. I just think that he was misguided and could not see out of his own echo chamber and dogma box. But that's our narrative. A, we have a real general problem with being able to reproduce results in science, yes. right? And this is probably a great example where when I'm just reading this about his research, you can directly correlate it to the narrative that's been going on as far as I've been alive. Um, and there's a lot of points on about sugar, for example, like there's the pure white and deadly uh, publication in 1972 that where they kind of indicate that actually a lot of the problems that you're attributing to maybe like high uh, red meat in a diet, for example, or, you know, saturated, is it polyunsaturated? Saturated, saturated fat is what's been demonized, but polyunsaturated fat is what's found in vegetable oils. And Got it. polyunsaturated fats have generally been championed for the last 50 years, corn, canola, safflower, peanut, soybean oil. But these are in fact, I strongly believe what are killing us. 
So we can really thank the mainstream narrative over the last 50 years for tens of millions of lost lives. Wow. Um, you know, he kind of ignored the, core, the connection to sugar though, right? He did. He did not. He did not believe that that was a problem, and that's that's a little more nuanced because um, I think that if you really dig into the literature, sugar is most harmful in the setting of polyunsaturated fatty acid excess, because it, it gets a little bit nuanced and there's a little es esoterica here. But you can actually cure someone of diabetes by giving them pure sugar. So that's a that's yeah, a carbohydrates. Insulin. Is that an insulin carbohydrates problem? Or? What's that? What, diabetes is what, an a insulin resistance problem? Or? Yes, diabetes is an insulin resistant problem. That's type two diabetes. Type one diabetes is an autoimmune attack on the pancreas. But there were experiments done previously where they fed people with diabetes pure sugar and their insulin resistance got better. So to say that carbohydrates cause insulin resistance per se is incorrect okay. physiologically. Now, no one should be eating pure sugar. There's no nutritional value there, right? <laughs> but but carbohydrates do not cause diabetes. Carbohydrates may fan the flames of diabetes in the setting of insulin resistance because, again, the physiology is complicated. But I really think that the, the striking conclusion that we come to when we look at the data is that it is vegetable oils. It is polyunsaturated vegetable oils. In fact, the exact oils that we have been told to eat as saturated fat has been demonized that are causing our bodies to become insulin resistant. And when we are insulin resistant, carbohydrates are a nightmare for humans. So it's confusing, right? Because carbohydrates can look bad. And certainly when someone is insulin resistant, the removal of carbohydrates can be very helpful, but it's not the root cause of the problem. And if they are able to correct the underlying metabolic dysfunction, which is caused by excess linoleic acid, which is a polyunsaturated fatty acid, then you will correct the underlying physiology and most people can reincorporate carbohydrates. I'm not advocating for processed sugar. Yeah. I would advocate, you know, and I, I'm I, think, literally... I think it's the opposite where you were talking about the demonization of red meat. Yes. But what I think that one study showed is, well, to your point, the people that are eating this are also eating a lot of sugar. They're also doing these other things. Other that, bad things. And it's affecting the results. Yes which is kind of, it's just reinforcing what you're saying, which is, okay, if we dial it back and we start from scratch and you look at the actual effect of red meat, for example, on the diet, quality red meat, what is the new conclusion? There are actual interventional studies like that and you can replace carbohydrates with eight ounces of red meat per day and inflammatory markers go down. Insulin resistance improves, meaning people become more insulin sensitive and markers of diabetes get better. So there's actual interventional studies that do that. And going back to your point, how many people do you know that go to a barbecue and just eat a hamburger without a bun and nothing else? People go to a hamburger, they eat a hamburger, well you, hamburger with a bun and ketchup with sugar and mayonnaise with vegetable oil and coleslaw with vegetable oil, right? But an observational study can't tease out which one of those factors is the important one. Interesting. And so that's the idea that generally because the narrative in this country has been so negative around saturated fat, when people are eating red meat, they're eating it with other junk food. Right. And well, you can't tell like which is which. So like you mentioned that, the condiments. Like yeah. The alone is like pure sugar in a lot of cases. Yes. Yeah. The condiments are um, probably what are killing us, you know? Yeah, that and salad dressings for people that drink. Yes. Stuff, right? like, yeah. Um, How much salad dressing is made from canola oil or safflower oil or soybean oil? Salad dressing something that is felt to be helpful. You know, people would think of salad as the healthiest thing. It's the worst thing, especially, you know, we talked about plants in and of themselves having toxins, but when you, when you put plants and you, you place soybean oil on top of them, you have an absolute metabolic catastrophe for humans. Um, so our, I want to make sure that I'm not deviating from your core message, but I think it, to me, what it sounds like is Okay, now we're back to square one. We've said there's all these other potential factors. What happens if someone decides they want to try this and what, what can they expect if they say, look, let's even as an experiment for 30 days or whatever you would recommend, if I went in onto this carnivore code type diet, what happens? Yeah, so in the book, I give you five tiers. I kind of break it down and I have sort of introductory training wheel versions of carnivore diet. I do include some plants that I feel are less toxic, 
These are mostly fruit and, and non-sweet fruits like avocado and berries and squash, which are all fruit when you think about it. They're not yeah. stems, roots, leaves, and seeds. So, but all of the diets that I would recommend in this book are animal meat focused, animal meat and organ focused. And so if you make these red, this red meat, these animal organs, the center of your nutrition, and then you add plants that are less toxic as sort of accoutrements, as uh, color, flavor, these kind of things for variety to make it easier for people. In the beginning, I would just expect that people would have maybe some adjustment, but it's, you know, I think within 30 days, and it's good that you bring this up, people will begin to see significant improvements in weight, mood, libido, body composition, it's an, an resolution of autoimmune disease. I mean, some things take a little longer, but within 30 days, and that's why I love these idea, this idea of 30 day challenges or 30 day experiments with this kind of stuff, like do it for 30 days, heck do it even for two weeks, but 30 days would be ideal. And you don't have to stop eating all plants, but understand, as I talk about in the book, which are the most toxic, what to make them the majority of your diet from, and then see how you feel. And I really believe based on what I've seen, what tens of thousands of other people have seen, that they will see improvements in almost every area of their life. You know, your dog might even like you more, who knows, but uh, you know, maybe you'll get a better car. You know, your, your car will be, you know, you'll get a, you'll get a new car. You know, the I can't promise that, but I think that red meat. <laughs> what's that? The key to happiness in the world is eat more red meat. I, isn't that amazing? What if it were that simple? I think it's a good step in the right direction. And um, I know that people are going to be hearing that and saying, what about the environment? I've done a number of podcasts on my podcast, which is called Fundamental Health, about environmental issues. Uh, if you really look at the way that ruminants exist on this planet, they have been here for millions of years before humans, and they exist within ecosystems. Cows are not destroying the environment, and evidence to the contrary is based on shoddy science done by the FAO in 2006, which was subsequently rescinded. So if you look at the claims that cow farts or cows are producing as much greenhouse gas in adjusted carbon dioxide equivalents to transportation, that is a completely baseless claim. And that claim was being made uh, upon a life cycle analysis of a cow's greenhouse gas production, which means every phase of the life cycle, to only tailpipe emissions from transportation. That's like comparing apples to oranges. Nobody has done a life cycle assessment of the greenhouse gas usage or production of their transportation industry. And if you compare tailpipe to tailpipe, which is what the Environmental Protection Agency of the United States government has done in 2013 and 2016, you compare apples to apples and you compare what a cow burps and farts to what comes out of tailpipes or smokestacks, ruminant animals account for less than 2% of the annual greenhouse gas emissions in the United States. This is EPA data. Transportation, 26. Electricity generation, 24%. So you tell me who the real polluters are, right? And so people really need to educate themselves. And there's so much insidious, misleading data about how cows are contributing to climate change um, that I'm really working hard to counteract. Animals serve a vital role in revitalizing grasslands and making the soil richer for future generations, monocrop agriculture is going to destroy our soil by depleting it of nutrients. It already has destroyed our soil. And continuing along this path will mean ruin for humans. The CEO of Impossible Foods wants to eliminate all animals from the planet in 10 years. He can have it. He's got the worst product out there though, doesn't he? Ecosystems will collapse. It's absolutely the worst product out there. It's made from soybean oil and cellulose and bamboo shoots. It's horrible. There's no nutritional value in it. A lot of stuff in there that would cause me a lot of headaches. <laughs> yes, it would cause you headaches and gas. And so, but that is your future if Impossible Foods, Bill Gates, Jeff Bezos, Richard Branson, and Beyond Burger have their way. So there's a, there's a lot at stake here. And it's, it's processed food. Um, on the rise, and it, it's, it's a pretty scary position, but eating like our ancestors, which is what I'm suggesting in the book, will, will lead people to, I believe, the best health of their lives. And it flies in the face of modern convention, so I would challenge all the listeners to really, um, to really step outside of their cognitive bias, bias and think for themselves, and, and read the book, even if you think I'm wrong, and read the 650 references I've got in there, because this is an idea that's really going to change the paradigm, I believe, and is critical. We're at a, we're at a crossroads right now in a lot of ways. And um, I believe that if we go down the wrong fork, 
it will it will spell catastrophe for our future generations. So I want to be conscious of your time because I know we could probably talk a lot about this. Um, I know we didn't touch on fiber. Long and the short of it, your stance is that we don't need additional fiber or fiber in our diet. You don't need, humans do not need plant fiber to, be, to have regular healthy gut function or poops. There's a whole chapter in the book where I break this down. I talk about microbial diversity. I talk about short chain fatty acids. I talk about evidence regarding constipation and diverticulosis and cancer. But for every single one of those points, there is solid medical evidence. Um, my own personal experience and the experience of hundreds of my clients and tens of thousands of people doing this, that humans do not need plant fiber to poop or to have a healthy gut. That is a complete fallacy. If anyone believes that fiber prevents cancer, they're wrong because there were multiple studies done in 99, 2000, and 2001 published in many prestigious journals, including over 6,000 patients, showing that longitudinally over four to eight years, the inclusion of extra or fiber, extra amounts or any amount of fiber in the diet did nothing to change the recurrence rate of colonic adenocarcinoma. So there's no studies out there that show that fiber there's no interventional studies out there to show that fiber prevents colon cancer in any way, shape, or form. There's no studies out there that are interventional to show that fiber prevents any cancer. And so, yeah, these are interventional studies. Again, we must not be misled by epidemiology. So it's a very interesting thing. And the same is true with diverticulosis, which is the outpouching of these sort of blind diverticuli from the colon. There's actually studies that suggest that the more fiber people eat, the more diverticulosis they get. And so who knows? And again, it's, that's a correlation. It, it, we can't say for sure, but it looks pretty concerning. Uh, with regard to microbial diversity, there's no evidence that fiber increases microbial diversity in the gut. There's just not. And removing fiber doesn't decrease microbial diversity. You can make short chain fatty acids to make butyrate out of protein just as well as you can out of plant polysaccharides and out of collagen. You can make plenty of stuff out of collagen for short chain fatty acids. So, you know, it's, um, there's, there's plenty of evidence that uh, humans do not need fiber in their diet. The, um, the other thing I'll say is that there's good evidence that fiber does not improve constipation, which will fly in the face of mainstream narratives, fly in the face. But if you look at the medical literature, it's not supported. Fiber will give you a bigger poop, but for people who are constipated, those bigger poops will be even more painful, cause more bleeding, and cause the use of more laxatives. So fiber is not the answer to constipation and the absence of fiber does not cause constipation. It doesn't, is it not a stool softener at all or is it? It's not. It's not interesting because it's fiber. No, I mean, it's probably like binding. I mean, it could, uh, some soluble fiber, maybe a, maybe a stool softener, but it doesn't, it doesn't solve constipation. And if people have hard stool, it's not, it's not a lack of fiber. It's usually a lack of, of adequate sodium or a lack of proper fats or <laughs> dysbiosis or lack of water or inflammation or milk dairy can cause constipation right right you don't fix right. constipation that's caused by dairy by giving people psyllium there, there's so many topics there i know we could dive into and i know i, I want to be conscious of your time so how do people get in touch with you paul uh you can check me out at carnivoremd.com is my website there's a link there to my book the carnivore code it's out august the 4th 2020 you can pre-order now, thecarnivorecodebook.com. And then your podcast is Fundamental Health? Fundamental Health, yep. And the same Available way. everywhere. Everywhere. There's a link to my podcast and my website, yep. I love it. Um, we didn't get into cell-based meat, which I'm always really curious about. We can talk about that another time. There's Horrible idea, yeah. There's topics, is it? Okay. Um, there's topics around sodium and water and everything that probably affect all the things we're talking about. So we won't get into that now. If you ever want to talk again, I, I want to leave it open that you're welcome to come back. We can do more time. Thank you. I know you got other stuff to do though today. So <laughs> and we probably- It's great talk and I love it. I'll try and come back as soon as I can, but I hope people will find this valuable and I hope they'll check out my book. I do too. Um, okay, a couple of quick things. Uh, one, who do you, Paul, spend the most time with? And typically there's that saying from Jim Rohn that you're the sum of the five people you spend the most time with. So who does Paul Saldino Saladino, spend the most time with? You know, um, right now I'm building a business. So I'm building a supplement company which does organ meats. It's called Heart and Soil. You can find us at heartandsoilsupplements.com. And for a lot of people, we didn't even really touch on this too much in the podcast, but uh, getting organ meats in the diet is critical. And a lot of people can't eat liver or spleen or 
uh, these organs that are so valuable for humans and have been treasured by our ancestors. So we're making those, those organs into pills. Oh. And right now I spend a lot of time with my COO of that business. We're, we're just about to launch in July. I'm not sure when this podcast is coming out, but uh, we're going to be launching. In a, in, <laughs> we're launching in, in late July. And so I'm spending a lot of time with my business partner and my COO from that business. And then I have some really good friends. I just moved to Texas and I have some good friends here that are also pretty darn successful entrepreneurs, business people, uh, and just awesome all around humans that are mentors to me as well. So I would say those are the majority of people I spend time with. And, um, you know, I think that, uh, I don't think Jim Rohn had this in mind, but the, if, 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 if nature were a person, that would be the last person. Because I think that as, uh, you know, as, um, you know, some of these early naturalists uh, used to say, you know, sleep on the earth under the moon is, is good for man. And, and I think that that's totally true. Um, the more time I spend in nature, uh, the more ground that I am as a human. So we'll, we'll be animistic and, and call nature the, the final person. And I think Mother that that's, nature that's counts, important. So. What's that? Mother nature counts. It does. Um, how are you, Paul, changing the world? You know, um, I think that I, my intention, my mission is to dispel untruths and to help people understand what is true and what is valuable because I believe that humans have this ancestral birthright to radical health and so many of us are forsaking it because we've been told incorrect information. And so it's really inspiring and really important to me to be able to bring this ancestral wisdom back to the forefront today and I really hope that that will change. And I mean, my God, we've talked about so much in this podcast, like I am fighting the prevailing zeitgeist that I believe is going to destroy our health as a country, erode our foundations. And, um, and I'm not doing that, uh, you know, for financial gain. I'm doing that because I believe that the health of um, future generations, your children, uh, I don't have kids now, but if I did, my family, that's important. I have nieces and nephews and I look at them and think, I want them to have good food. I want them to know what to eat so that they don't have to suffer. Makes total sense. And that's a great mission. I applaud you for that. The final thing is when we have interesting people on the podcast, we like you to nominate other interesting people. Usually the first person that comes to your mind is the best. We talk to experts and entrepreneurs about the person they serve and problems they solve. So who would you, Paul, like to nominate as a future guest of Automate and Grow? So one of the uh, people that I spend time with, one of those five people that I spend time with is the, um, the founder of a company here in Austin called Perfect Keto named Anthony Gustin. And uh, it's a fantastic individual. I had dinner with him last night and I think he's a, a very good human and thinking a lot about some of the stuff you and I were talking about before this podcast, which isn't really germane to the nutritional conversation, but is relevant to the broader conversation about our changing world today and and how we as humans move forward in the most rational way in what seem to be some pretty turbulent times. And Anthony's just a pretty good guy, understands nutrition a lot too. I love it. So Anthony Gustin from Perfect Keto, you've been nominated as a future guest. We will follow up and get that introduction. Paul, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate your insight. Thanks so much for having me on. This has been another episode of the Automate and Grow podcast. We will see you in a future episode, hopefully with Anthony of Automate and Grow.